visit to Dragon Con, but certainly not his last. Mr. David Tennant! Takes off the mic stand and does all that. Um, 
Uh, I do, what is, that's a very good question to which I don't have an immediate answer. Let me think. Uh, Scrooge McDuck. I mean, he, he at least has the same accent as me. I mean, I wear pants more regularly than he does. Uh, and I'm not quite as rich, but... Uh, yeah, Scrooge McDuck, I will say, is the rather unlikely answer to that question. It's the perfect broke, answer. Something broke. I broke something. <laughs> <laughs> That's a clip to snap to the table. Oh, oh. I've really broken broke dragon con. <laughs> we'll fire three people. It's fine. Just fell. <laughs> it's Velcro to be the backup, but well, you brought that to you. This one's got a safety This is safety pin on this side. Who gets the purple awning? Who if gets you that? want it, you can have it. It goes with my eyes. No, I feel too far away from you now. I'm coming closer. Aww. Yeah. My heart. That's a Come scene. on. Come on. Remember, you may be on DCTV right now. Just remember. Yes, sir. <laughs> Gabby, did your mic? Do not drop your pants. Do I believe I like <laughs> Hi, Gabby. Hi, Gabby. Hi. Hi. What's did your you find the button? Sorry. Did the button? Was it working? Yes, the button's Good. working now. Good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I have my first question here. Hi. Hello. Um. Uh, I was wondering, in Love Slavers Lost, if you uh, ever said or were tempted to say Alan Z at the part where Baron says Alon. <laughs> Did I attempt to rewrite Shakespeare with catchphrases for me? Stranger things have happened. With catchphrases from 21st century Doctor Who. Is that, is that what you're asking? That is precisely what I'm asking. This is the sort of thing, when I went to do, when I went to that very show, I went to Hamlet and Love Lives Lost at Stratford upon Avon, in the, in the middle of doing Doctor Who, like during the hiatus. And this rubbish that was written about how Doctor Who fans were all going to turn up to see Hamlet dressed as Cybermen. Give us some credit, please. <laughs> um, well, okay. Hey, you're a good audience, you can come again. <laughs> uh, uh, I never did, no, but I should have done, and it was an opportunity overlooked. <laughs> so if we ever revive it, I'm taking that with me. Thank you for the tip. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Thank you. All right, so since you are an Agile fellow, oh, yeah. we have a cordless mic and oh, yeah. we prefer that as well. Yeah. All right, what do I do with that? Whatever you want to. We've heard the term of that. Is it on? Yeah. Gabby? Cheers, great, look at that! Um, I mean, it wasn't very 
funny, but I got bitten by the hellhound. <laughs> Which is funny, after the event, at the time it was just really painful. Because <laughs> the hellhound, the actual little dog, the little dog was trained to attack famine. Spoilers. Worked the thing up with the stunt team and uh, the guy who played fan fan had all this stuff down his leg and all this padding and the, the little dog was only a cute little thing, but they trained it and when he sort of I don't know growled at it, chewed it, chewed it his funny prosthetic teeth, it kind of went mad and, and chewed on his leg. And then a couple of days later, I had to, if you've seen the show, cast a spell to suspend time and send us into another dimension so that we could talk to the Antichrist. I'm just, you know the usual. <laughs> Yeah, which involved me sort of going, Rah! at which point the hell I obviously thought, that's my cue! <laughs> and ran in, and I went, Rah! Rah! <laughs> and I lifted my leg and it was hanging off my leg. Besides, <laughs> his teeth in me like that, only the dog. Little cretin. I know. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that was, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's slightly funny after the event, it wasn't, it was quite painful. I had to have shorts, and I, you had to have shorts if you get bit by a dog. I didn't know that. <laughs> so if you didn't know that, does that mean you've been bit before and didn't get shot? Probably, yeah. <laughs> awesome. And yeah. um, so that was the only the dog story, and then he wasn't, he wasn't allowed on set after that. Ooh, I know. Poor I, was, I said it's fine, but I, he wasn't allowed, because there was children around, you know. <laughs> So did the dog stand in play the role afterwards? He was then C all the shots that were done after that, he CGI'd in. <laughs> and he shot on a green screen in seclusion somewhere. Aww. Because he was genuinely dangerous. <laughs> and then we shot him. <laughs> oh, we did. We did shoot him. We did not shoot the dog. We did not shoot the dog. It was a lethal injection. Starved today. It was fine. He's fine. He's fine. He's fine. And now he doesn't have to act anymore. Now he has to retire and have a lovely doggy time. Aww. Happy ending. Yeah, it's lovely. Gabby, your next question. Hi. My question is: um, Do you, as an actor, find it beneficial to go and see other actors in plays, like in live theater? Oh, that's a good question. Beneficial is a good. I, I don't know. Is it beneficial? I certainly do it. I enjoy doing it. I like seeing good people. I get excited when I see people I don't know, and I get excited when I see people doing things I've not seen them do before. And I like, I, I like, I like going to the theatre, and I like acting, and I like stories. And so it's something I would do anyway. I think whether I was in it or not. Um, but it's, it, sometimes you, you see someone you go, wow, they are extraordinary, and then six months later. You, the, the world catches up. It's quite an exciting place to maybe see some emerging talent from. Uh, uh, Funny enough, back in 2000, and what would it be now? Nine, eight. I went to see a uh, play called Fat Face, and I was, there was the, there was this uh, performance in it. And I thought, who's that guy? He's he's amazing. And that was Matt Smith. First time I ever saw him. So his name is Smith. Smith. Okay. No problem. So, uh, did you see Billy Piper and her show in the West End? I did, yeah, but I knew her already. Yeah. <laughs> way, way back. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, uh, no, I did see Billy's latest thing was uh, that she did Yarn when she came to New York, which was you know, amazing. She's so wonderful. I love her. She's very great. Right. She, yeah, she's all right. She's been here before. She must have been here, yeah. She has. Yeah, yeah. She's not right. She's awful. <laughs> Say John Barrowman. I said Billy Piper. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. He's fabulous. He could be here this year, so we like to poke fun at him because he likes to come all the time. Where is he? Did he go to? I don't. Where? Oh. He chose Indiana over Atlanta. Got it. Cool. He's great. He's been here what four or five times. He was here last year, yes. Yes. In fact, when Billy Piper was here, he opened the panel as her moderator. Oh. It was so joyous. Oh. <laughs> I didn't want to do you out of a job, though. Because you're very good. 
uh, a nicer human, a nicer, well he's not a human being, a nicer creature than Aziraphale at times. You know, they sort of balance each other out, yet they're supposed to be all good or all evil. And that's true of everyone. So you, you don't, you, you, as, a, as an actor, you try not to label anyone as good or bad. They're just doing what they seem to feel like they need to do at that moment. And if, those, or if, if all those choices add up to a, a rather unsavoury individual, that's sort of for, uh, to be judged after the event, to be judged as some of its parts, really. That's my excuse, anyway. <laughs> it says something about your, your acting style. I, I would imagine as an actor, you, in your morality compass, in your personal life, you're going to be drawn to something that stretches you as an actor outside of that. So maybe that's why you keep getting those amazing darker parts. Let's you're so see that. light and lovely in person. Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> let's definitely see that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to think, you know, it is always, it's interesting to go to the extremes of human experience. Sure. That's, as an actor, you're drawn to the idea of trying to walk in the shoes of a pair of shoes that you would normally walk in, you know? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it, it's, uh, yeah, you're, you, it, what, what, you're, you're always looking to try and push that envelope and sure. see what, what would that character be like? Would I be able to get there? Or would I be convincing as that sort of person? Um, and, uh, and, yeah, and they, all, they all have elements of you. They go to, everything that yeah. you do has got to be filtered through your version of what it's going to be. So uh, whether that whether that person is ultimately perceived as good or evil is sort of something sort of that's sort of the end result. You've got to try to try and find the the, the shades of grey within that. Good answer, Alex. What's your next question? Uh, this is a funny question to follow that. Hi, David. I'm Sarah. Hey. Thanks for being here. Um, you've done such amazing work with child actors. How is it working with such talented young people? Oh, uh, I've just done a show actually with it. lots of kids in it, and they were great. And um, uh, it's a well, it's funny. What's tricky is that they are funny hours usually, right? You know, child labour laws. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so usually they're only there for part of the day. So you often do their their camera angle, and then they'll go home or go off to do homework or things, and then you'll be you'll be playing to sort of a script supervisor on their knees with a script. <laughs> So it has certain challenges, I suppose. But um, uh, well, it's you know, it's just like working with any actor, actually. And there's, there could be something about uh, uh, there's a show that I do in the UK. We've just done, we've done, we're about to start the second series, um, but it's quite a small show, and I don't know. It, it's on Britbox over here. I don't know if that's something that many people have, but it's right. It's a secret. It's called There She Goes, and it's a show uh, uh, written by this comedy writer called Sean Pye and his wife, who. Um, have this daughter with a very rare chromosomal disorder, uh, undiagnosed, but she has lots of challenges. And, and they wrote basically a sort of a sitcom about what life is like. And because it's their story, it's beautifully unsentimental, incredibly politically incorrect, and yet completely true and completely sort of, uh, they're very honest about their own reaction to that, how, the, how difficult that's been, and uh, uh, how Sean himself reacted very badly to having a, a, a daughter with that. It's been on this huge journey to kind of come to terms with what that means as a parent. And it's about parenting and it's about, it's a really good show and it's something I'm really proud to be part of. And of course, in the center of that, there's a little girl. Uh, and uh, 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 this girl called Miley, who is extraordinary. And I think there's something about being a child actor where you, you can, she has a wonderful unselfconsciousness about her. Uh, because of this the story of a real girl, a uh, little girl called Julie and, uh, and, and Miley studied Joey met Joey and studied videos of her, and Joey's got quite you know, extreme challenges in her life, and, and Miley just slips in and out of this. With, and it's so true, and so clear, and so wonderfully unsentimental, which is what that show means. And I think that, that there's something about the, the, the kind of, uh, the unsentimentality of a child actor that, that really right. nails that. I think a, a, a grown-up actor might always feel a little bit, I don't know if it would be embarrassed or self-conscious about sort of slipping into having this disorder, having all these particular ways. Yeah, kids are fearless. Kids They're are they... absolutely yeah. fearless. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that that can be, there can be something very uh, exhilarating with that. And you meet also going to go, you know what? This is a wonderful job to have. Get over yourself because right. there's something to just be true and be honest and there's something to learn from that. 
Yes. What a great question. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. Gabby. Yeah, give it up. That was a really great question. So, What did you ask, Gabby? There's somebody at the front. Somebody at the front? Oh, hey, so sorry, the lights are really bright. What's your question? Hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I see your ploy. <laughs> Hi. Hi. What's your name? Where'd you come from? Share your questions, both of you. Um, I was wondering, is the wig you wore during the Dolphins was it aggravating? It, uh... Well, wear is really frustrating sometimes. When you've got wig just now, yes. it's annoying you. Yes, all the time. Uh, um, well, I didn't have a wig a lot of the time. A lot of it was my hair, and then I had a wig for some of the bits. And then we had, like we were saying earlier, a bit we added bits. I mean, as long as you're not wearing it all the time. It's all right, as long as it's not too hot. We went to the desert in South Africa and did the Garden of Eden and stuff, and it was really hot. But the bigger problem in the desert was having big old snake eye contact lenses in. So that kind of, that's all I was focusing on. So the wigs were okay. But I hope you have a good wig day today. Good luck. <laughs> Table. I haven't done any doodling yet at all. What did Matt draw? Oh. It was some, like, somebody named David. And uh, he's the worst. Um, did he? No, just kidding. No. He was just doodling. He's one of those people that likes to keep his hands going. So he just didn't chair race, though, did he? <laughs> just saying. He did not chair race. So his artistic expression was a little different. Different, that's all. different, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gabby, who you Hi. Hi. Um, so if you had to choose one to be your sole means of transportation, would it be the doctor's TARDIS or Crowley's Bentley? Or now, perhaps, third option, uh, desk chair. <laughs> like it could be dimensionally transcendental, I'm just saying. Uh, it's a good question. I, I mean, there is something about a TARDIS that I think I, I, as all, I've always, all my life, like, fantasized about having a TARDIS. Because you can go back and change, correct mistakes, change things, win the lottery. Um, time travel is a very seductive idea. So it would be wonderful to be able to and awful and destructive and terrible. But think of all the good you could do. And let's hope we'd all do good rather than just winning the lottery. I guess if you won the lottery first, then you could do lots of good with the money you earn. Could you? Yeah. And you could go, yeah, you could go and all the terrible mistakes that the world makes, you could go and try and alter and try and although then it's chaos theory and butterflies and Amazon forests and you know. Right. Yeah. Um, Butterfly effect, so I don't know. It's probably better we don't have a TARDIS, but I would quite like one. Well, as an actor working on Doctor Who, were you ever privy to the types of rooms that were within the TARDIS that were never shown on camera? We only ever showed one other room when I was there, which was the costume room, okay. which is basically just the one room we had <laughs> with, a bit of, with some costumes thrown over and a bit of CGI to make it look a little bit different. Right. Um, I, yeah, I, was, I remember as a kid, the, the, the stories where they would go deep in the TARDIS and you'd right. see endless corridors and new rooms, and I always liked that. Um, so yeah, I think there's, uh, it would have been nice to explore a bit of that. Because we never, you know, we never, you know, we never... There might have been a Bentley there, yes. I'm sure there's a Bentley yeah. there somewhere. <laughs> I mean, it's virtually infinite, I think, so there's probably something of everything. Yeah. The Bentley was, I mean, yeah, the Bentley, because it was a real Bentley, and uh, I, I did have to drive it, and it was a nightmare. I mean, it looks pretty, but old cars are hard to drive. No power steering. No power steering. Double deep clutches, that's the thing that would do me in. You have to put it in and in and back out and back in again. So not, not only is it a gear stick, 
um, which I got out of the habit yeah. of driving, I'm honest. Big clutch. You're double, you have to do okay. double clutch it, clutch it, and then uh, no, clutch back in. And I'm like, wow. While remembering your lines. Yes, while well remembering your lines, and while driving this thing that's worth kind of 850,000 pounds, because it's old and fancy, you know. So I, I was quite happy to not, to let other people drive it now sure. again. Yeah, put someone else in the way and shove them in it. <laughs> Alex, what's your next question? Hi, you're my favorite doctor. It's so nice that you're finally. <laughs> Thank you. You're my favorite questioner. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, you know, no disrespect to anyone else. That's good. They're, they're the first person to say that. So. <laughs> I mean, how long have you been here? Celeste and McCoy fans in today. <laughs> okay. So I was wondering when you were filming Time Crash with your favorite doctor, oh, yeah. how much of what we saw on the screen was just you acting and how much of that was you being a fanboy yourself? Well, you see it had been written of course by Stephen Moffat, who, uh, so all the lines were his, but he was very much writing them I think with a view to as a fan himself who had grown up watching Peter Davison and who had then become a friend of Peter Davison's. Uh, I, it, was, it was only the second time I'd met Peter when we filmed that thing. I see him sometimes now. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it was quite odd and quite odd that, 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 that I had all those lines in You Were My Doctor and I, I, I wore the specs because of you and the sand shoes and all that. I mean, it was, it was very cleverly written by Stephen because he was tapping into clearly some things that I was thinking. Um, so it was a very lovely experience to, to get to do that and to get to do a, a sort of an homage to one's own childhood. Um, and you know, Peter's all right, he's quite fun. So um, it was quite nice to get to do that, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Great question. Yeah, very good question. <laughs> Gabby, who's next? Um, hello, love. Um, my name's Claudia, and I'm curious, um, to go back to your podcast, in which we're hoping you're going to do a second season of, um, you're really good at getting people to open up and just tell wonderful stories. Who else might you want to interview if you are going to do a second one? So, did you see the last bit of that again? Um, who else would you like to speak oh. with? To maybe get them to open up and... To right. Get... Well... What's interesting, what I, what I didn't consider doing at all, because in, in the first the first bunch of ones that we did, it was all people that I, either I knew somebody who I knew very well, everyone I had some sort of connection to. Even, there were a couple of people I'd never even met, but I, we had some sort of way into them. So there was always a reason why I, I had a link to get to speak to them. And, and they were all people that I thought were pretty cool. Um, I suppose what would be interesting, what would be a challenge for myself, is to interview people that I don't necessarily think are perhaps somebody that I might disagree with, perhaps. That would be interesting. And I don't know how well I do at that. I don't know how I'd be able to keep my cool or, you know, be interesting to quiz someone that I really don't understand. That I don't understand what is going on in their brain, how they could have, yeah. And I suppose, you know, that people who've got different world views, people who have, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be interesting, and I dare say none of them would be interested in being part of it, but it'd be interesting to talk to some political figures and to quiz them about quite what is going on in their diseased mind. Um, I don't know if I would be, I don't know if I'd be able to keep calm. That's, that would be interesting, you know, when you, because obviously it's, it's wonderful to talk to the, some of the people I would talk to and to, and I, but I feel an affinity with them all. I suppose the challenge would be to talk to someone that I just don't understand. Someone who seems to make extraordinarily poor life choices. Um, <laughs> and, and to really try and... Try and... Because I do... I, you know, I do... I, you, put, you know, the world's in a place right now. <laughs> um, my country is certainly in the middle of a terrible sort of political crisis at the moment. Um, you don't have all, all, it's not going all that great over here, if I may say. <laughs> um, and I, it's, 
it's, it seems to me that there a lot of that's to do with, 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 and this is on both sides of the Atlantic, both, both kind of ideologies have got so entrenched. Um, the left and the right are further and further apart. And, and, and it, I would, you kind of think, well, it's, it's very easy to just get angry and just get furious and go, what the hell are you thinking? Why are you thinking this? But I, I guess that we, to, to mend these bridges, to work together, we've got to try and find some common ground. We've got to try and make sure I, I have no idea what Boris Johnson is thinking. <laughs> I, I, I cannot understand. He used to be reasonable and vaguely liberal. He's turned into this monster uh, who seems to want to drive our country off a cliff. I'd love to sit down and go, what? <laughs> and try and find out what, you know, try and reach out. I think we've all got to, and I've certainly got to get better at sort of going, I, your, your ideology is so beyond me. But I've got to try and understand this so and somehow meet in the middle so we don't all disappear in a yeah. 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 There is no way we're all just shouting at each other all the time and getting more and more angry and more and more entrenched. Um, and that's easy to do when, when people do things that make you furious. But um, that was a very long-winded, slightly uh, irrelevant answer to your question. <laughs> No, it's great because the truth is, I don't know if I would be able to be sit down in a studio with Boris Johnson for two hours. I might hit over the head with a chair. But, but I, I'd like to think I would be able to uncover some new truth that would, would so we could all sit down and be happy. Save us all. Oh, oh please. <laughs> I, 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 give me just a moment because I saw her hand come up a little earlier. What's your question? Okay, we've got to do the microphone. We can't just people in hotel rooms. There's people who are still not out of their bed going, I can't hear her. It's your fault for not getting out of bed, by the way. But here we go. Thank you so much. I'm a huge fan. Thank you. I love you in the Big Finish audios because we can continue the doctor's travels. Do you think you'll continue doing them? Well, if you keep asking me to. What great costume, by the way. Very, who have you come at? Um, Assassin's Creed. Oh, yes. My son knows about that. <laughs> I'll tell him it's very good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd love to keep... The Big Finish is great fun. I, it'd be great to... And it's lovely to get to uh, spend a day with Catherine and with Billy and, and with Bernard and, and all the people that, you know, uh, we, we, we made the show with all those years ago and to try and remember how we did it. <laughs> try and remember what the voice was and all that. Um, so it, it's lovely. They're so well written. They're such great things to be part of. Um, and... Uh, it's a nice reminder of, of what that time was like. We need to persuade Freema to do some, I think. I think we should. We might need to work on her tomorrow when she gets here. Um, I get to do a panel with her on oh, yeah. Sunday for Sense8. Oh, yes, of course, yes, yes. So be sure to come check that out. Yes. Plans. Oh, I'm so excited. Mm. Martha. Yeah, she's incoming. She's not here today. She's not here yet. No, she's she's incoming. Here. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Alex, what's your next question? Oh, popped right up like a groundhog. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I got the butterflies. Um, almost forgot the question. Anyways, um, my question to you is, who do you think you had the best chemistry acting with over your whole entire acting career? <laughs> That's you to name names. Good chemistry. Probably my wife. <laughs> Uh, you know, and uh, 
uh, there she goes, I get to work with Jessica Hines, who I also got to work with in Doctor Who, I think he's, he's a wonderful person to work with, Olivia Coleman was a joy to be in uh, this series with, yeah. So I, I've, had a, I've had a bunch, I, and it would be, um, it would probably be, well, rude to uh, create a sort of league table, um, although obviously uh, Georgia is in a league table all of her own. <laughs> She's watching this, I'll get really good fun. <laughs> Hi, G. <laughs> that, was, that was a great question. Thank you for asking that. Hey, Gabby, who do you have next? Um, I was told I wasn't supposed to get any more questions, but I can take more if you want. Watch out. Well, I'll get this one in the front then. Okay. Okay, we'll go to the front, everyone. All right. <laughs> Hi! Hello, to my husband. Hi. Hello, little husband. What's your husband's name? James. And where is James? James is uh, uh, probably in Anniston, Alabama, where we live, uh, getting ready to go to work. What does he work at? Uh, he works at the Honda plant uh, as a security guard. And he couldn't get one sunny deal for him to come here. Unfortunately. James, I'm disgusted. <laughs> James, where are you? Because all these people turned out to see you, James. Where are you? Today, you can take one sodding day off and come to Dragonfly. My question is uh, during the Doctor Who, um, uh, which doctor or the doctor where they did the time uh, where you said the women walkie talkie well, I mean, That was most of them. Yes. <laughs> well, do you ever go off book of the script and just like, you know, have a line that you just want to say and, and you just, you know, add it? Yeah. Oh, really? No. Because it was, it's quite, it's a, it's a show on our lead show, Russell T. Davis and then Stephen Moffat and now Chris Chibnall. It, these are big writers who know what they're doing, and they, these scripts are crafted. And you, it was, we were pretty loyal to the script. It was very rare that we would we would uh, put in anything really that wasn't already. You didn't have to. You didn't want to, and there wasn't time. So you just kind of you the script. You, you got the script, and you kind of loved it. And uh, we, we no, we didn't really do a lot of uh, yeah. So no. <laughs> James. Do you have somebody okay. else? Okay. Yeah, we'll come over there in just a minute. Give me just a sec. Alex, we've had people patiently waiting all day. Hi. Um, Hi. So my question is, what's your favorite breed of dog? I want to have something to talk about. Ooh, my favorite breed of dog that's not dead. <laughs> my favorite breed of a live dog. Um, I'm not a massive dog, but we have a dog. We have a dog. We have a, we got we got hypoallergenic dog because there are allergy issues in our household. So that kind of limits what you can get. So we got a cockapoo. Oh. It's a tiny thing. It's only about that big. Uh, it's a toy cockapoo, I believe, is the term. From a, its father was a toy poo. Um, uh, I don't know that its mother was a toy spaniel. I don't know how that worked. A ladder. Um, I wasn't there for the conception. I never met the parents, in fact. Right? Uh, but we have we have a, a, a Myrtle in our house, and she's very sweet. She's very stupid. Very very stupid dog. She loves to run after a ball, but if she, if the ball leaves her vision for even a second, she forgets where it went. Object permanence, got it. So it goes. If she sees, if, unless she follows it, then she and she can run really fast. She's old now. She's like six now. And dog gives that's a lot, right? It's, it's like it's my age. Um, right. And uh, but it, but if if she doesn't turn her head quick enough or it goes too high. She just, she, it's gone. It's like it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> which does make you think if, that, if, if that's her worldview, that when you're out of the room, you've ceased to exist. <laughs> which is the way she gets so excited when you come back in. But, I forgot about you! I forgot you were a thing! <laughs> um, 
so she's she's very sweet, she's very uh, uh, good natured. We have a lot of small children who, and small children, they love the dog, but they can also be quite, you know, they can stand on it and they can, you know, <laughs> not, not, you know, it's just, yeah, sometimes you get, yeah, sit on them, fall on them, yeah. you know. And she's little, so you can, sometimes you don't know she's there. But you have other pets aside from them? We just have a dog. Okay. That's enough. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of children. They, they, they count as pets. Um, <laughs> Well, you're not allowed to put them in cages at night, which is weird. Yeah, you're not. Apparently, you're not. We tried it for a while, and we told you that one. Um, no, we didn't. That's not true. Although, um, uh, don't, no, I don't know that. I, I'd say that's my. That's the only dog I've ever lived in a house with. So I suppose by default that would be my cockapoo. The cockapoo. I always used to like a King Charles Spaniel. Because I just like the sort of the drooping, the ears that are the slight of colour on the face. I quite like that, but I think I'm allergic to that probably, so uh, we'll stick with the colour. Gabby, you have someone? I do. And then I'll come over to you, ma'am. Hi, I'm Cal. I wanted to say thank you so much for coming, David. My birthday is on Tuesday, and my best friend waking up early with me this morning was honestly the best part of this weekend. I wanted to ask if you have a best friend or someone that resembles that in your life that's helped you play different roles, like maybe the relationship between Crowley and Aziraphale. I didn't quite hear that. What was that? <laughs> Do you have a best friend in your life that helps you friend. like, kind of portray roles with a relationship like that? Like the one between Aziraphale and Crowley? Oh, you mean like a real life best friend that helps uh, translate when you're acting to be able to have that buddy come in? You mean like specific to good omens or just who's a, who's a kind of sounding board? Just in general. Just in general. Just, just in general. general. Well, I mean, I suppose. Oh, I'm you don't have any friends. I don't have any friends. <laughs> But it's true, you know, that's the person that I spend most time with and that I sure. kind of bounce things off. But she's very she in terms of acting though, she can be very withering if I get <laughs> if I get too self-obsessed or uh, it's okay, she pretentious be. about things. <laughs> so uh, she keeps my feet very firmly on the ground. <laughs> yes. Which I think is I think we all need a bit of that. Yes, agreed. I wanted to come back here. Ma'am, you have the glasses on top of your hair here. Uh, what's your question? Oh no, we need to get the microphone. I can't even see where you are. Was the microphone coming to you? I see someone running. Alex is coming up to you. There Thank we you, go. Alex. I was just wondering if you realize just how popular you are over here. <laughs> Do you know how popular you are? Sir? Not only. place full, the line was still wrapped around the building and down the road just to get to see you. Well, I can attest of all the doctors that I've interviewed over the years, he smells the best. <laughs> Shakespeare, because they're not 
he didn't write a lot of parts for women, and when he did, they were mostly boys with wigs on. So, uh, as we're still doing these plays, we should find a way of making them reflect the society we now uh, aspire to. So, um, I I've just been working with Kush Jumbo, um, who's a brilliant actress who's about to play Hamlet, for instance. Um, which, uh, and I think th there's going to be more and more of that, and that's very exciting. So it's probably not the time for me to be taking up any of the female Shakespeare roles. I think it's probably the time to let the balance of scales go the other way. However, in an ideal, in a, in a, in a, in a different future where that's, we're not thinking about that, maybe. Oh, well, let me think. Oh, let me think. While you're thinking, I plan oh. on asking Catherine to take the reverse question later. Just uh, <laughs> well, um, Oh, I don't know. The, the play that's very difficult to do nowadays, I think, is Taming of the Shrew. So I think, I think you, you, you do that play and you kind of think, is this just, are the kind of sexual politics of this play, are they just outmoded now? Do we just, you know, we can do endless productions where we try and sort of, oh, but actually it's this, and he's saying that, but he means that. Maybe that play just is tricky for a modern audience. Unless maybe you swap the genders there. Maybe that's an interesting thing to do. Maybe that would be the one to do. Maybe Catherine should play Patricky when I can play Catherine. Maybe that's what you should do. So, um, um, I don't know many others really. I mean, there's a lot of wonderful Shakespearean roles. Uh, Lady Macbeth? Well, yeah, maybe. Be too tricky, tricky. Beatrice, yeah. Rosalind did not actually like it. It's a pretty great part, I think. Um, Queen Margaret in all the history plays, that's pretty great. But um, but like I said, I don't think uh, I'll be taking any of those parts anytime soon. I just saw you as Juliet, because you're so youthful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Gotta pace your fiery footed steeds towards Phoebus Larching. Such a what not, I'm not going to do a speech from Juliet, that's right. Very nicely done, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Alex, your next question. Hi there. Hi. Um, I know you've been doing some work with, some voice work with Rooster Teeth, and you've done an absolutely amazing job as Scrooge McDuck. Um, I was wondering, what has drawn you to voice acting? Well, I only get people ask me to do it. You know, um, so it's, but it's great to do. I mean, it's quite an odd thing to do, especially with something like Scrooge McDuck, and indeed with the Rooster Teeth uh, job. They were based over in this country, and I'm, usually recording them in the UK. So it's, you, you'll go into a little booth in London somewhere, usually at the end of the day, just as California are waking up on the other side of the world. So they're all there bleary-eyed at sort of 8 a.m. going, morning, and, and you're, they're on Skype in a corner, and you're in a booth with headphones on, on your own, um, just kind of acting with yourself for a couple of hours, roaring yourself hoarse, usually. Um, so it's quite a weird, because you don't act with anyone else, you don't, it, it, you're, you're kind of, with something like DuckTales, because we've done quite a lot now, you kind of you get into the groove, and you sort of know what it is, but at first it's, you, you really are going, I don't know what this character is, I don't know what the other actors are like. Um, but it, it, it's great to be part of something. There's so much creativity and imagination, and you know, you, you, you record a voice, and then months later you see this beautifully animated thing that you get, um, a disproportionate amount of praise for, because really the, the joy of it, the, the, the magic of it is in what the animators do. So I'm, I just like being part of that world. Is there anything you take into the booth with you when you do any voice recording that... I always take my pants off. <laughs> there it is. Um, and I mean, just make sure the Skype, right. you, you know, you're, you make sure the camera... You get to wear more casual wear. So you can wear whatever you like. Exactly. Yeah. And it does get quite hot in those booths usually. Sure. Um, uh, no, I don't, I don't really have any, uh, just a large jug of water is usually sure. well, about all, all, all that you get. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that question. Thank you. It's really good. Yeah. Thank you. Gabby, back over here, what you got? We're going to have time for three more questions. This is number one. Okay. And I'll come to the front and then we'll round you out. Okay. Alex. Good afternoon, Time Lord Victorious. Hi. <laughs> so, the Tenth Doctor is very clever. So clever that he was able to fix the TARDIS so it can now jump universes and still work. So, having said that, which universe would you want that TARDIS to land in first? The MCU, Middle Earth, Hogwarts, 
the DC Universe are Westeros. <laughs> oh, now this question is going to take months of careful consideration. <laughs> They're all pretty dangerous universes, aren't they? They're all full of peril. Uh, oh, I don't know. That's a very good question. It would be... Mm, I, I mean, I grew up loving Marvel Comics. I, I, absolutely, I got them every week. I, was a, I loved them all. I still love that world. And now that it's... Now that it's uh, so there's, there's two Marvel universes, aren't there? There's the comics one and there's the cinematic one. So that's another question. <laughs> DC, I've come to rather later in life. Mixed bag. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Westeros, I loved it. I loved Game of Thrones right to the end. I don't know why everyone got so hit up about it. I thought it was great. Um, uh, what? Which, which one? Which would you go to? Uh, Hannah Barbera. Oh, nice. <laughs> Last Olympics, all the way. <laughs> Suffering, sabotage. That's a great answer. Do you remember Laugh Olympics? Yes. Laugh Olympics. That's where I would want to be. I would want to be in Laugh Olympics. Good answer. Got me out of a hole there. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> so if your hand is loud and proud, stand yes. up. If you, are you able to stand? You would, okay, because I want to make sure I can see you. We, right. we, we, we're we're, we're not going to hear you. Here we come. Here we come. Here we come. So I, I think he's quite a good, he's quite a good role model. Um, yeah, uh, it's never really bothered me. I feel like I think we can take it. And you're very good at letting us come here and pretend to be Americans, so we're very happy about that. So <laughs> we'll take that. Yeah. You're not American. No, always. Uh, no. Not always. Not always. Time. Yeah, yeah. Alex, take us home. Our last question. Oh, make it a good one. No pressure. No pressure. pressure. The world this is watching. Is, this isn't the best question we've ever had. We'll be disappointed. <laughs> but just relax. I think I've got a good one for you then. Okay. Oh, is what? it that What? I can't see. Where are you? I think oh, we're here. Are. Yeah. What is your earliest memory of Doctor Who ever in your life? Oh, I absolutely know what this is. <laughs> I absolutely know what this is. And I can work out how old I was because I can date when it was on TV. And it was watching John Perry turning into Tom Baker. Now I can only have been three years old. Maybe four if there was a repeat, I don't know. But I was young. And now having kids that age, I think that's weirdly young to have such a vivid memory of something. And it spurred a conversation with my parents about actors, a conversation I vividly remember. It was really, it was a quite important moment for me. Because I remember seeing that and thinking, that's something about that just captured my imagination. The idea that this character could turn from one. And then I suppose that was talking about that this was two different actors and that actors were the people who were in the stories, who pretended to be. And that, you know, I didn't grow up in a household where there were actors or I didn't know any actors. So it was, it was a concept that I had to kind of come to terms with. But I remember vividly having that, uh, seeing that, being mesmerised by it, having that conversation and thinking that would be a great job. <laughs> um, 
and, and that was my first memory of Doctor Who. I was then I then watched every episode. As far as I'm aware, I never missed one uh, growing up, and uh, and it was the start of what I then you know miraculously ended up doing for a living so far. Um, so it was a it was a big moment, and it was yeah, I, it was 1974. So I was three years old, oh, which is remarkable because I'm still only 28. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Ray Juliet, and he said, yeah. That was a really great question. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. Well, ladies and gentlemen, one more chair raise. Come on. All right, all right. Come on. Count us down from five.